Hey, what up everybody? This is Stevie Breach coming to you. Uh, the other night I was able to watch the Royal Rumble uh, 1992. I watched it right there off of the uh, WWE Network. This is a uh, very famous, very historic Royal Rumble. I know that it's one of the most uh, watched ones when people are trying to get hyped up in order to watch the, the Royal Rumble on pay-per-view every year. Everybody always talks about the 1992 Rumble. I don't think I'm going to be surprising you guys by talking about this as the, the Rumble where Ric Flair wins uh, the WWF Championship uh, for the first time uh, in his career. Um, basically, the, the, the Royal Rumble was made into an event where basically the championship was on the line uh, due to back-to-back -back pay per views uh, ran by WWF with uh, phony false finishes uh, between The Undertaker and Hulk Hogan in the, in the main event. Uh, those, of course, being the uh, 1991 Survivor Series uh, and also Tuesday in Texas, which was the, uh, I guess you can say, sort of test run of the In Your House series. Uh, where basically WWE would be having a, a non-traditional style pay-per-view. Um, the show's on the WWE Network, if you've never seen it. It's only like an hour long. The shows were dirt cheap. I want to think the pay-per-view is maybe $15, $20 uh, at, at max. Uh, the, the event really didn't work uh, to the point that they thought it was going to. It came off days after the uh, Survivor Series. Um, like, I, pretty much like if... The Survivor Series, I think, was held on a Thursday because it was traditionally on Thanksgiving. Uh, this was only like five or six days later, uh, however many it is from Thursday to Tuesday, on a Tuesday. And um, it was just, you know, they, WWE already got their money uh, for the 1991 Survivor Series, but they thought if there was a championship match involving Hulk Hogan and a rematch for the championship, I think they thought they would be able to hook him in for another one. Um, basically, Undertaker beat... Uh, Hulk Hogan at Survivor Series 1991 turned around. Hogan beat Undertaker at Tuesday in Texas. Uh, but basically, Jack Tunney thought that um, the championship needed to be upheld and uh, basically told Hogan and Undertaker they would both be able uh, to compete in the Royal Rumble and they would be given random numbers between 20 and 30 because they were the number one and number two contenders going into this. They thought that was about the fairest way they could do it uh, to where nobody was really, really getting pissed at what they were doing. And so, you know, basically that was the hype up of uh, everything that was going down uh, for the Royal Rumble. Uh, just like this, um, you know, with the other shows, the undercard on here is, is, is terrible. There's three out of four matches, which I don't even know why these guys were fighting. Uh, the opening match was the new foundation going up against an older Orient Express. I spoke in, in, in raves about how great the Orient Express versus the Rockers match was, um, the Orient Express looked a lot older in 1992 than they did in 1991. Pat Tanaka was basically wrestling in a sweatsuit. Uh, very, very loose top. Uh, definitely wearing sweatpants. Kato uh, didn't move with the speed that he did uh, the year before. Uh, this match just wasn't good. Owen Hart and Jim Neidhart as a team was very, very weird. I honestly thought they were high energy when they first came out. And then I noticed that their names of the new foundation, which may be like, oh yeah, Owen Hart and Coco Beware was high energy. Uh, but the new foundation was able to get the win over the Orient Express in the opening match. Not really that excited about it. From there, we went to a Roddy Piper versus the Mountie. Uh, this was an Intercontinental Championship match. Days earlier at a house show, I think in, in uh, New Hampshire, uh, basically um, the Mountie defeated Bret Hart uh, for the Intercontinental Championship. And then not only after beating him for the Intercontinental Championship after the match, uh, the Mountie attacked him with a shock stick uh, that he used to carry. A lot like how the big boss man would have his baton and he would hit people with it. The Mountie had a shock stick, which basically was a taser, and uh, he, he tased people with it. And uh, if you can remember the TNA Six Sides of Steel electrocution match between LAX and the Dudleys, where they would play the loud, shocking noise um, over the intercom uh, so all the fans in the arena could hear it, that was basically the same way that the uh, WWF did this uh, back in 1992. Um, but basically, um, Roddy Piper came out and, and finally stopped the Mountie uh, from beating down on Bret Hart. Uh, I, I don't know why they did this title change. Even as a kid, this was a very shocking change. Uh, Bret Hart was still involved on television at the time, so he wasn't really that injured. Um, I think that what they were doing was playing up the fact that they were trying to build up the big WrestleMania match between Roddy Piper and Bret Hart. Definitely one of my favorite WrestleMania Intercontinental Championship matches from, from all throughout the day. Um, 
I know if you go watch the Roddy Piper DVD, uh, Roddy Piper basically says in the DVD, in the documentary, that it was his idea uh, to put the Intercontinental Championship on him. Uh, it was um, Vince who came uh, to Roddy and asked him if he would work WrestleMania. Uh, Piper basically said that if he was going to do it, he wanted something for it, and he had never been a champion at the WWF before. Um, so I guess they, they drew out a plan for Piper to win the Intercontinental Championship and then lose it back to Bret Hart. Uh, Piper says that Piper and Hart are really... Uh, related, uh, you know, through a lot of cousins and things like that. I don't know if that's something that they just sort of made up, but he still plays that up as a as a real time angle uh, that was going on. But Piper uh, defeats the Mountie uh, to win the Intercontinental Championship in a short match. Uh, nothing really big here, but I've always remembered the title change, which was always big because the Mountie beat Bret Hart at a house show. Uh, so the footage they always show is, is never really that that clear. Um, it's never shot the right way. It's not like a, it's like a pretty much a hand cam camera down at ringside and um uh it, it's just something that always sticks in your mind much like when you watch the diesel uh, versus bob backland title change like the way that shot is really really weird so you always just sort of remember that uh from there they go to the beverly brothers uh going up against the bushwhackers nothing much here uh except for it's all basically about uh, the nerd jameson you don't remember who he is I don't blame you. Uh, basically him getting bullied by the genius on the outside and basically the Bushwhackers helping Jameson, even in their losing efforts, get revenge on the genius, uh, punch him after the match. We go there from there uh, to the National Disasters, uh, beating the Legion of Doom uh, by countout. Of course, everybody knows that Legion of Doom, the champions, can't lose the titles due to count out. But the National uh, Natural Disasters and Jimmy Hart act like they've pulled off the biggest coup of all time. Running out of there, uh, like we, we scored a victory over the other guys, but Legion of Doom is still the champs, so I guess they get the last laugh at the end of the day. Uh, from there, they went right into the uh, the Royal Rumble. Um, they, they interviewed Shawn Michaels uh, before. Uh, it turns out that Shawn Michaels' heel turn on Marty Jannetty and the Rockers um, was just days before uh, this. It, it's kind of surprising because uh, when I watched Rumble uh, 93 tonight, uh, they have a match on that card. So it's kind of surprising that that feud was still going strong a year later. Um, I know that uh, Marty uh, left for a good time at the WWF and then he came back. So maybe that's how they kept it fresh, but it's keeping Marty off television. But the Shawn Michaels was, was going with this new sort of boy toy um, sort of... Uh, gimmick at this time. Uh, the show kicked off with DiBiase and the British Bulldog coming down. DiBiase always gets screwed in the Rumbles. He's always number 30 or number 1. Uh, but this time he comes out number 2. British Bulldog dumps him out pretty early. From there, Ric Flair comes out number 3. Uh, and then you just got a long list of guys come out. It fills up the ring. You got Jerry Sags, Haku, Shawn Michaels, Tito Santana, the Barbarian, Texas Tornado came out. He wasn't in this for that long, but He's always one of my favorite guys. Repo Man, Greg the Hammer Valentine, Nikolai Volkov. Even with all these guys coming in here, nobody really that big. Boss Man, Hercules. Just guys coming in, guys getting eliminated, some guys hanging around for a little while. Uh, but the first real big pop of the night is when at number 15, Roddy Piper comes out. I don't know if this was basically due to... Um, the fact that the the championship was on the line, so you want to have the biggest names you got out there. You know, Piper wrestled earlier in the night, and they don't really use guys uh, more than once in the Rumble. It's either you have an undercard match or you're in the Rumble, and um, Piper got to do both, which was pretty fun. He hung around uh, for a long time in the match before being dumped out later uh, by um, by Sid Justice later, but. Uh, from there, it really starts to fill up with the big names. There's a lot of guys at the bottom didn't really mean anything, but uh, Roberts, Duggan, IRS, Jimmy Snuka. Uh, number 20 ends up being The Undertaker. Um, and uh, Undertaker, you know, you just been champion at their Survivor Series before being stripped of it at, at Tuesday in Texas. He's a guy that people are really looking at, you know, coming in to do some damage. He's followed by uh, Randy Savage. Uh, the Berserker comes down. Uh, you might, might think, why are you going to talk about the Berserker for a little while? But basically, for Washington Wrestling Challenge and Wrestling Superstars, the Berserker is a guy that would wrestle on these jobber shows. He would win every match by picking guys up throwing them over the top rope, causing a countout. And, uh, you know, not many guys won by countout, and this guy won his jobber matches by countouts, by throwing guys over the top rope. So how was he not a favorite 
to win this deal. As a kid, I honestly thought the Berserker had a great shot at winning the Rumble. Surprise, surprise. Uh, from there, we go to Virgil, Colonel Mustafa, Rick Martel. Hogan comes in at 26, Skinner. Sergeant Slaughter at 28. He had just been champion uh, at, at WrestleMania, winning it last year at the Royal Rumble, beating um, Ultimate Warrior. But surprisingly, he's still not really a favor. Didn't really last in it that long. Sid Justice, you know, fresh off coming from WCW. This is his first run for the WWF. He came in at 29. Warlord uh, was at 30. Um, the final four, um, uh, when the Rumble was, was going on, um, you know, it built all the way down uh, to basically being Flair, um, Sid Justice, Hulk Hogan, and, um, shoot, was it Macho Man? I think he was the Macho Man. Son of a bitch. Who was the other guy? guy? Um, yeah, yeah, Savage was the last guy in there, I'm pretty sure. Um, Savage, he gets um, thrown out. By Justice and Flair teaming up, leaving the the final three: Hogan, Justice, and Flair. Um, basically, Hogan and Flair are, are fighting, and it looks like Hogan's trying to find a way to dump uh, Ric Flair over the top rope to leave it just to, to be the two big guys in there. Sid Justice sort of sneaks up behind, even though that Hogan is his buddy, and dumps o Hogan over the top rope. And um, even the WWE Network, they always say they have the, you know, the original footage. Sometimes they put the Coliseum video up. Sometimes they put something that they've produced either for you know 24-7 uh, or for a DVD or, or something else down the road. It, the, the, the footage is a little bit doctored. If you watch this back in the day on the live pay-per-view stream uh, before it went to the Coliseum home video, the crowd goes bananas. Uh, you know, even though you know, there have been a few title changes somewhere along the way, uh, Hogan dropped the belt to Andre for a little bit, setting up the, the WrestleMania 4 change with the Macho Man Randy Savage, uh, which led to Hogan getting it back and then holding it all the way until um, uh, he lost it to The Undertaker, and then The Undertaker got it back. But the, the fans were pumped that they knew they were going to see a new champion. They might not have been booing Hulkamania, but uh, Vince didn't like this, and he went into sort of... Uh, sort of patch mode to try and clean this up a little bit, and you can totally tell that you can't hear the the fans when Hogan gets stumped out. Um, but from there, it's um, uh, it's down to Sid uh, Sid Justice and Ric Flair, and Hogan's on the outside, and he's doing his politicking and he's bitching and complaining to the referees that he shouldn't be on the outside because his buddy dumped him out, and basically he reaches out and he grabs Sid Justice's hands, and Justice is sort of shocked at what's going down, and Hogan starts trying to pull Justice over the top rope to the point where Ric Flair comes over and he just picks up Justice by his legs and flips him out over the top rope and Ric Flair becomes the champion. He goes into the back, he gives one of the greatest wrestling promos that everybody remembers with a tear in my eye. Uh, you know, he he's there. Heenan's going bananas. It's probably I didn't even talk about Heenan on, on commentary. This is probably one of the best shows just to watch because of Bobby Heenan on commentary. This is probably A-plus work by him. He did a lot of great stuff over his years. Wrestling Challenge, Wrestling Superstars, Primetime Wrestling. Him and Gorilla doing just about anything. Uh, he works well with a lot of other people. But um, on this show, uh, you know, what's fair to Flair? Um, and, and getting Ric Flair the championship because he is the uh, executive consultant, I think is what his, his, his title was at the time. It works, and it's gold. This is a great show. I honestly highly recommend you go check out the Royal Rumble 1992. Maybe fast forward uh, to the um, the actual Rumble match and not, not watch the undercard that much. But um, I, think, I think even if you don't have a WWE Network, I think just... The Rumble itself is on the Bobby Heenan DVD. It shows you how great the commentary is. But check this out. You'll enjoy it. I loved it. Peace out, everybody. Have a good night.